All right, hi everybody. In this video today, we're gonna to be introducing you to evolution. I'm sure you already have background information on evolution. You've already had some in, in science classes before, um, but we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper than perhaps you did in junior high. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about the history of evolution and just sort of where did Darwin come from? Where did his ideas come from? We're gonna talk about what made his idea so unique from other ideas that had been posited before him. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, artificial selection, sorry, having trouble talking. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to skip this video. I'm not a huge fan of it. It's fine, but I didn't feel like it meant much. Okay, so big question, how do organisms evolve? And that's what we're going to be looking at here. So first of all, we're going to back up and get a little bit of history. Um, according to this, it says science does not happen in a vacuum. Da Darwin did not freestyle evolution. So he is influenced by the scientists that are living at the same time that he is and prior to him. Um, so if you take a look at the timeline, there's all kinds of things that are building toward his his eventual theory of evolution. So we start out with a scientist named Malthus, and Malthus is an economist who is looking at population dynamics, and he starts to um, come up with a theory that human disease, human wars, human poverty is due to human population accelerating faster then resources are accelerating and that's causing the population to come back down. And so we start seeing this idea of population dynamics that population go populations increase too fast and they are limited by the, um, the resources that are available in the environment. So Darwin says, that's part of the crux of what he's looking for. There's competition for limited resources. So he doesn't know what mutations are. We're adding this now after the fact, but take a look at this diagram. It says mutation creates variation. So now we've got these different organisms. Unfavorable mutations are selected against. Reproduction and mutation occur again. So we have these guys reproducing and more mutations. Favorable mutations are more likely to survive and reproduce. And that's at the heart of what he's saying. He doesn't know the word, Darwin doesn't know the word mutation, but still the idea as, uh, is the things that are, that are favorable in the environment allow them to survive and reproduce. All right, moving on. Oops, what did I do wrong? I screwed it up, sorry everybody. Wow, sorry about that. Okay, moving on. And out of here. Okay, so let's talk about Cuvier. So Cuvier is French and he's looking at extinctions. He starts noticing um, the fossils. They've, they've been noticing fossils for a long time, but he starts noticing um, what bed or what layer in the bedrock the fossils are located. And he starts hypothesizing um, why are some organisms going extinct? Why are some organisms found only in certain layers and not in other layers? Now he doesn't agree with evolution once Darwin comes up with it, he believes that there are um, reasons to explain why there are organisms in some layers and not others, like a flood, for example. He says a massive flood kills everybody in that layer, and eventually new organisms come and populate that particular um, area. And that's why you see new um why you see new fossils that are coming up. But he makes some important ideas. The law of superposition, true still today, um, is the idea that the oldest layers contain, or I'm sorry, the lower layers in the bedrock contain the oldest fossils, and the more recent layers are on the top. The problem is that we have all kinds of things that, that affect those results. Um, as layers get added on over time, then there's erosion, then more layers get added on, then there's more erosion and more layers get added on. And so it's super, this diagram makes it look like, oh, you could tell how old these organisms were just by seeing the, the strata, the layer that they're in. It's in fact a lot more complicated than that. All right, and then we have Lyell, and Lyell comes up with this idea of uniformitism, which is the idea that things that are happening on Earth now, they've always been happening like that. And so if we see something occurring on this planet, we can assume that the same forces were occurring on the planet long, long ago. And he's studying geology especially. So he's saying, I can see rivers cutting paths in um, in, in our land. And so we can assume that rivers have always been cutting paths through the land and that maybe they led to valleys that form um, between mountains. Maybe there were rivers that were causing that kind of thing. So he's looking at this principle of a very, very, very old planet and that things that were happening long ago, they're still happening today. 
So then we get um, Lamarck, and Lamarck actually is one of the very first to come up with an idea of evolution, but his idea was miss the mark. It's not quite right. So if we compare the two on this diagram, it's a good comparison of the two ideas. So Lamarck has this idea that um, um, acquired characteristics can be inherited. So this is the flaw in his idea. He believes that organisms um, acquire traits during their lifetimes and then pass them on to their offspring. We know that that's not accurate because it has, it has to have to do with genetics. So his idea, giraffes, for example, is that giraffes stretch their necks to reach trees or leaves high up. And then they give birth to babies that have longer than average necks. Well, we know that's totally false because it didn't have anything to do with their genetics. Darwin, interestingly, comes up with the answer without really understanding genetics. His idea is that some babies are born with taller necks, some are born with shorter necks. The ones with taller necks reached more food than the ones with shorter necks. That made them healthier um, and able to have more time to have babies, to raise those babies to adulthood. And then long necks become more common in the population. That's natural selection. And that's how it differs from what Lamarck said. But Lamarck came first and he really he did have an idea of evolution. He just didn't have it quite right. So this is what Darwin has been, this is what he's stepping into where he is in science. Oops, I just noticed that's in our way. All right. So, whoops, try again. There we go. All right, moving on. So really quickly about Darwin himself, um, he was a smart kid, but nothing super, you know, exciting. He was wealthy. Um, he considered entering the seminary for a while. Um, he went to medical school, ended up becoming a naturalist, and he um, he got a job as a naturalist on a ship, the HMS Beagle, that traveled around the world, which was really quite remarkable back then. Um, the job of a naturalist is so wickedly cool. They basically um, traveled with the ship and every Everywhere that they landed, um, it was Darwin's job to um, collect, to note all of the plants and animals. He could name them. Um, and so it was just a matter of learning about all the, the organisms around the planet. And that was his job, is to collect information about those organisms. Um, he did go among many places. You can see all the places that the HMS Beagle traveled. But one that was really important for Darwin was the Galapagos Islands. He, and we're going to talk about them in just a second. But he started started noticing that organisms in the Galapagos Islands were really uniquely adapted to the food sources in the Galapagos Islands. But what was even more interesting is that those animals looked a whole lot like animals on the mainland, um, but they had some interesting adaptations. Now, it doesn't say it in this presentation here, but what, what appears to have happened is that the animals, Darwin didn't know this, the animals' ancestors actually did come from the mainland. Some of them flew if they were birds, some of them swam, some of them got blown over during in debris during storms. So huge Atlant or Pacific storms um, brought them over over to the Galapagos Islands. And then they had to make the most of the food sources that were there, the ones that could survive because they had nice mutations that allowed them to crack into seeds or eat different types of foods. They survived and they passed on those traits. And the ones that couldn't handle the new island living, they passed away. And so over time, we've seen these species on the Galapagos Islands changing from their ancestors on the mainland. Um, and that's what Darwin started to notice and started really giving him some ideas. Example of what I'm talking about, marine iguanas. Um, in, at the Galapagos Islands, there are these iguanas that swim and they eat algae underwater. No other lizard in the planet is able to swim or eat algae. Um, remember that it's salty and it, it's um, got cellulose in it. Um, it's not a good food source for most animals. But these guys over time were um, the ones that were able to swim, the ones that were able to digest the algae. Those are the ones that survived. And now we have this very unique population of iguanas. Um, giant tortoises, they're the only place in the world. But each island, so they're all one species, but each island, has its own variety of giant tortoise, and their shells look really different depending on which island they're on. It appears to have something to do with the food sources. Finches, same thing. Finches on the Galapagos Islands. There are 12 separate species. Just to be clear what a species is, it means they can't mate with each other and produce viable offspring. We'll learn a little more about that later, but that's just a rule of thumb. 
different species don't mate with each other to have um, viable offspring. So what um, we have learned about finches in the Galapagos is that they have really unique beak sizes. Let me see if I can get my picture out of the way. So these three birds are all finches, but notice the size of their beaks and what their beaks look like. Mutations that change the shapes of the beak. On some islands were advantageous for big seeds. On other islands, they were advantageous for small seeds, depending on what size was um, what kind of seed was available. We even have super interesting data um, where we can watch beaks change just from year to year. Um, and I'll come to that in just a minute. So Darwin came home, he published a journal, he married his cousin, he had four children, buried one of them, did a lot of other work, and didn't publish his very controversial um, book, for 20 years. Now in the video, I think that you're watching in class, um, you learn a little bit about his competitor, his partner, his idea partner, partner um, Alfred Russell Wallace. But Wallace um, sends him information about his theory, which is exactly the same as Darwin's theory. And Darwin goes, whoa, and he publishes immediately. So you need to understand that in the scientific community back then and still today, if a scientist wants credit for their ideas, they have to publish. Like, that's the rule. So you get published in journals, you publish a book, but the first person to publish gets credited with the idea. So how many of us remember the name Alfred Russell Wallace and how many of us remember the name Charles Darwin? Um, sadly, Wallace did not publish soon enough and Darwin gets um, his name on the idea of um, evolution. So Darwin wrote, and you definitely need to know this, um, The Origin of Species. So that was the name of the book that he wrote. And you can still purchase The Origin of Species at pretty much any bookstore um, in the country. So what are his great ideas? Well, the, the main idea is the idea of natural selection. Remember, Lamarck is saying that these organisms are sort of purposely changing and passing those traits on to their offspring. We know, for example, a bodybuilder, a human bodybuilder, doesn't give birth to a baby that has particularly strong muscles. Muscles. The only time that baby will have strong muscles is if that baby grows up and bodybuilds also. So let's talk about how Darwin figured it out. He has kind of four steps that you definitely need to know. Number one, overproduction of offspring. So he, his idea, and this has to do with um, Malthus also, way more babies are being produced, not just human babies, but you know, offspring all over the planet are being produced and can actually survive. So if you look at, for example, a dandelion, how many offspring it has in each of those little dandelion seeds, bajillions, how many of those actually survive into adulthood? Very, very small percentage. Even among birds, for example, oftentimes birds will um, lay it depends on the species. So we'll say 10 eggs during a season, and maybe they'll be lucky if one achieves adulthood. Um, it, and so it's just, there are many, many more babies are being born than can survive. Done. All right. Number two, all of these babies are unique. They all, especially for um, sexually reproducing organisms, all of the babies have their own unique um, characteristics. If you take a look at the um, ladybugs, are those ladybugs or Japanese beetles? I don't uh, notice the spotting and whatever. They're all a little bit different. Step number three, and it's not necessarily sequential steps. It's just part number three. Um, competition for limited resources. So when the population starts to increase, and this is what Malthus was talking about, um, soon the resources start to, to become less and less. And now we have to compete. Who's going to get access to food? Who's going to get access to shelter? Who's going to get access to water? Who's going to, et cetera? Who can escape from the predators? Those are all things that are going to have an impact on who survives. And then step number four, the ones that survive, this is so important, have more babies, well, for sure than the ones that die, they don't have babies. Um, but the ones that are more successful are going to leave their traits, which we now know are genetic. They're going to pass those genetic traits onto their offspring and their offspring are going to be more likely to survive. And that process will continue. Um, the part that's interesting is if the environment changes, um, let's say, let's talk about giraffes for just a second. So we have um, giraffes with these really, really tall necks. What happens if all of the tall trees vanish? 
humans cut every single one of them down in a matter of 10 years. There's no tall trees left. What happens to giraffes? So it's not necessarily always advantageous to have a long neck. It depends on what's available in the environment, where those giraffes are located. If I bring a giraffe over to my backyard, Oh, no, my backyard has trees. I was trying to think of like a place that's just grassy. Um, giraffes might not succeed that well if all they have to survive on is grass. They need tall trees. All right. So then the idea here is that these steps are repeating generation after generation after generation. And the idea here is that this planet has been around for four and a half billion years. Life has been on this planet for about three and a half billion years, I think three and a half billion years. Um, so that's a lot of generations and a lot of time for changes to happen. All right, moving on. Oops. Oh, I didn't realize it went up close on these. Sorry. And repeat. All right. So um, what's the evidence for this? Well, Darwin couldn't point to evidence specifically because he can't show history and and like millions of years of history. So he looks to artificial selection. He looks to what's happening today to say, see, this is evidence that it can happen. So artificial selection is the idea that humans have actually caused a mini evolution in some of the products that we like, pets, crops, those are those kinds of things we have artificially selected. So if we decide we want a very tiny dog, then we breed dogs, we choose the smallest babies, and we breed those babies, and we choose their smallest babies, and we breed those babies, and we choose. And over time, we see the dogs getting generation after generation, we see the dogs getting smaller and smaller. Same thing has happened with crops. This is an interesting one, the wild mustard crop, and how humans have affected its evolution to lead to to, to um, vegetables that are as diverse as kohlrabi and Brussels sprouts. Um, if you could see the, the plant that is the ancestor of the corn plant, it's called the teosinte plant. And it's a grass, like it doesn't look anything like corn. Humans changed the evolution by constantly selecting the teosinte plants that had more and more grains on it. Um, and eventually we end up with these cobs of corn. Okay, so that's called artificial selection, and Darwin uses that as sort of evidence for his um, theories. Okay, so the finches, the selective pressure of the Galapagos environment has driven the evolution of the finches. Beaks are super important. So current recent research has been able to see slight adjustments in the size of the, the, the finches beaks based on whether the years were dry or wet. And the, the dry and wet years determine what plants are more abundant and what size their seeds are. And so different sized beaks were advantageous in different years, and this is recent. Um, um, and they've been able to document those changes in the beak size. Pesticide resistance and um, antibiotic resistance are devastating um, examples of natural selection in, in, um, in action. So in this example with pesticide resistance, that's a bug spray that we spray on crops, we spray to protect people, whatever. Um, so let's say there's, um, mosquito is a good one actually, DDT is a good example of a very dangerous pesticide that we use to kill, um, very dangerous environmentally, um, that we use to kill mosquitoes. Um, so when we use DDT, we kill, you know, I'll make up a number because this isn't real, but we'll kill 96%. Actually, here are the numbers right there. We kill 96% of the mosquitoes. That's awesome. What about those 4% of the mosquitoes? Who are they? they are the ones that survived the DDT. Now we've just killed all of the weak mosquitoes and now the 4% that are left behind, those are resistant mosquitoes. So they start having babies. And what do you notice starts happening over a matter of months to the mosquito population? More and more and more of them um, are being born resistant because their parents happen to have been resistant. The exact same thing happens with antibiotics and bacteria. Um, as we use an antibiotic, we kill, I'll make up a number, 99% of the bacteria. Who's left behind? Who are that 1%? The resistant bacteria. And so who's going to have babies? Now we've gotten rid. We've made all this clear space. There are all these dead bacteria. There's no more competition. Who's going to start having lots and lots and lots of offspring? The 1% that weren't killed by the antibiotic because they were resistant to that antibiotic. 
And now we're finding that we keep switching antibiotics and more and more and more bacteria are multi-drug resistant. They are resistant to many, many, many different types of um, antibiotics. MRSA, which is the example down here, actually there's two, um, but this one is a MRSA example. That's the name of a bacteria that is multi-drug resistant. Um, and then over here, they actually show um, the same thing happen, happening actually with um, HIV in this circumstance. There's a medication being used and this was a long time ago, but a medication that was used um, to try to slow HIV progression. And within a matter of weeks, the patient's HIV um, was immune to the whole process because we got rid of the weak HIV and left behind only resistant HIV. Um, so super interesting to be able to see. We, the reason we can see evolution in these organisms is that they are so short-lived. It's hard to see or, um, evolution in organisms that take you know super long times, years and years and years, decades to reproduce human beings, for example. But in these organisms that are reproducing every 20 minutes or more sometimes, um, we can really see them changing and evolving. Here's an example of a um, modern example. So this is um, a plant that existed in, that does exist in um, Florida. And this is the beak size of these little soapberry plants. And you can see there's a, a wide diversity of beak sizes from these soapberry plants sucking on these balloon vines, um, balloon vine fruits, that's what they're called. But then there was an introduced species, an invasive species that didn't belong there that got rid of some of the native species. So what happened to the soapberries? Well, they, the soapberry bugs, they actually started to change their lengths um, of their beaks so that it was better able to feed on this invasive species instead of on the original species. So we can see the soapberry bugs changing. <clears throat> if they couldn't change, then the soapberry bugs would have gone extinct. But they had some variation in their initial population that allowed those um, some of them to survive on this invasive species. They had babies, they passed on their shorter beak traits, and they were able to survive that big change. All right, um, almost done here. Common ancestry of life is a sort of a fu fundamental conclusion of natural selection. We are going to be looking at phylogenetic trees and cladograms in great detail. Um, so these will all start to make sense to you, and I'm not going to go through them right now. And skipping ahead, last thing, um, two facts explained by common, whoops, common ancestry. There we go. Um, comparative anatomy, we're able to say if we have a common ancestor, then we can understand why so many organisms have what are called homologous structures. Homo means same. So they're structures that are the same from one organism to another. Why do so many have homologous structures? The idea is that they all had a common ancestor. A super common misconception is that humans came from apes. That is not the idea. The idea is that they all have a common ancestor. In fact, all life on this planet has a common ancestor. Not that humans came from apes, but that they have, it's like me saying I came from my cousin. That's not at all what uh, evolution is saying. I, my cousin and I came from an ancestor back. What is it? What is it? Like a great grandparent? I don't remember where cousins, how we're related, but anyway, a grandparent, great grandparent. We came from them. We didn't come from our cousins. All right. Um, and then similarity between, give me a second, similarity between fossils and modern organisms can also be explained by common ancestry. Um, just one more thing here. So trying to explain why organisms have certain traits, we can do that with evolution. This is a 40 sec, five second video. I think I'm going to skip it. You can watch it yourselves if you decide you want to do that. And I think we're done, everybody. All right, have a good rest of your day.